Hello and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman and today I am speaking with professor of philosophy Michael Humer. Michael is the author of books such as Skepticism and the Veil of Perception, Ethical Intuitionism, The Problem of Political Authority, Approaching Infinity, Paradox Lost, Justice Before the Law, and the title we are discussing today, Knowledge, Reality, and Value, A Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy. This is my conversation with Michael Humer. So I've been at University of Colorado for uh, over 20 years. Uh, I've written eight books, over 70 academic articles in various areas, uh, ethics, epistemology, metaethics, political philosophy, and a very small amount of metaphysics. I have a blog called Fake News, F-A-K-E-N-O-U-S dot net, which, uh, which everybody should check out. And the book we're talking about today is Knowledge, Reality, and Value, a Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy. Why is it just mostly common sense? Well, I mean, you know, some of the stuff that, that comes out might be surprising and not entirely intuitive. Um, but, you know, mo- most of it is pretty sensible. Before I get into the specifics, can you give a general outline of what the book is? Yeah, you know, so I've, I've taught philosophy for, you know, a couple of decades. And um, I had a hard time um, getting textbooks that uh, had what I wanted or, you know, were the way that I wanted. So, you know, like sometimes there would be anthologies, but um, most of the philosophy articles and chapters that we use are not written for students. So like it was never quite satisfactory. Like, you know, you want to teach about determinism or something and then you assign an article about determinism, but it's written by some academic and was not written for students or, you know, it was written written by some guy like 400 years ago. And uh, students find that hard to read. And then so, you know, and then there are all these uh, textbooks that cost like $80 or something ridiculous like that. And I didn't feel like I should ask students to pay that. So anyway, so I finally decided I was going to write my own book that I could use in my classes. And also, plus, you know, then I could um, sell it to other people, just, you know, anybody, anybody on the Internet who wants an introduction to philosophy. You know, there's stuff about um, epistemology and ethics and metaphysics. And I try to cover like uh, what would be big topics that you would want to see in an, in an introductory philosophy class. So, you know, like about skepticism, free will, um, the mind body problem, of course, the existence of God, a few chapters about that. Have you been using it as a textbook for your classes? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. And I'm guessing, huh? is this the first book you've written that wasn't published by like a major university press so that you could write it in a way that would be fun and interesting? Yeah, well, it's the first book that's not published by a real publisher, right? <laughs> like, you know, I published books by Rutledge, which is not a university press. Um, yeah, I self-published this one for a couple of reasons. Like one is uh, then I can control the price. And with my other books, um, people frequently complain to me that they're too expensive you know, like whatever, $40 or $80 or something ridiculous. And and you have no say over. Yeah, I'd like, I, those books. well, I would lower the price if I could, but I can't. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, if I self publish it, then I get, I get to say, plus then I get a much higher percentage of the royalties. So like there could be a lower price and I could still be receiving more money per copy. Right. And then, but also, also I can completely control what goes in it. You know, I can, I can say whatever I want. So like, um, you know, the endorsements on the back cover of the book, I think a publisher would not have allowed me to include the endorsement from Plato, where, <laughs> where Plato says, Yeah, that was, that was quite a get. <laughs> yeah, where Plato says, my work is all a series of footnotes to my humor. Uh, <laughs> and, right. And, you know, they, like, you know, they don't, they don't have a sense of humor, like <laughs> the traditional publishers. Right. And then it's a really fun thing about the book. Like it's written, it's written seriously, but you can, your sense of humor obviously comes through on most every page, every other page. Yeah. And by the way, like also publishers hire these copy editors that introduce errors into your book, or they just have like bizarre (laughs) conventions. Introduce errors? Yeah. Like, you know, because like often they don't understand what's going on in the book. Like, and if it's a specialized book, especially, yeah, you know, so they don't understand. And so like they've made an error that they don't understand doesn't make sense or they misunderstood what what you were trying to say. Um, But also, like often they just have this is weird, but often copy editors have bizarre idiosyncratic misconceptions about the language. You know, like a a common misconception is like, um, you know, a split infinitive is a grammatical error. 
No, it isn't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, you know, they would have other more idio- idiosyncratic, weird ones. A preposition is nothing to end a sentence with. Yes. That is the kind of nonsense up with which I will not put. <laughs> <laughs> so the title of your book map- maps to some of the major sections in it. Knowledge, yeah. is epistemology, reality is metaphysics and value is ethics. Right. I'm, my question is. My understanding from my local bookstore is that metaphysics is the study of crystals and obscure spirituality. (laughs) Is that correct? Uh, Well, that's not the kind of metaphysics that I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's what you see in the metaphysics section in a bookstore. But that's not what you would see in that. Uh, Oh, why is that? I assume that's more popular than, you know, academic philosophy metaphysics. Uh, Academic philosophy metaphysics is... um, you know, big questions about the nature of reality, but not crystals and um, psyche powers, but questions like, do we have free will? Is there a beginning of time? Does the universe have a creator? And, you know, stuff like that. Can you talk about broadly, what is relativism? Why is it so popular with students? And why do you hate it so much? Yeah. Uh, so relativism is, you know, roughly the view that truth is relative. Okay. And I don't know, what does that mean? I mean, I don't totally understand what it means. And I think partly because you know, I'm not sure that it's coherent, you know, I'm not sure there's a coherent doctrine, but, you know, it's that something could be true for one person and not true for another person, right? And I mean relativism about truth in general, like that's what I talk about, um, you know, not that there's some specific kind of thing that's relative, but just truth in general. Now, uh, you know, when I first started teaching philosophy, I talked about it more and I felt like it was more popular than it is, maybe, maybe it was more popular than it is today. Um, but, you know, people like it because they think that um, you're being tolerant if you say that truth is relative or something. And if you say that truth is absolute, then you're committed to saying that, you know, when people disagree, one of them has to be wrong. And that sounds mean and is going to hurt the feelings of the person who you think is wrong or something like that. It's like a way out of supporting dogmatism or something. You know, that, that's kind of like what people think, like, oh, so if you if you think truth is absolute then you that means that you think that your own beliefs are absolutely true and everyone who disagrees with you is wrong and oh that's dogmatic and intolerant right of course that's a complete misunderstanding of what dogmatism is you know dogmatism is not um being logically coherent okay and like if you believe p it deductively follows that p is true like follows from P that P is true and follows from P that everything that's incompatible with P is false. And, you know, assuming that this is what the word wrong means, it follows that anyone who believes a thing that's incompatible with P is wrong because that's what, you know, just what it means. So it's not being dogmatic to just be logically coherent, you know, to just believe what logically follows from your beliefs. Okay. It's just mean. Yeah. Being it's dogmatic is like, you know, not considering counter evidence, right? But, but fa- you know, because I believe something and I believe that things that are incompatible with the truth are false doesn't mean that I refuse to consider counter evidence, you know, to, to anything. Do you think that people often who say that all truth is relative really mean something like humans don't have certainty <clears throat> available to us? Oh. I feel like that's my experience, that pe- people talk about relativism and, and what it seems like they really mean is that you can't have certain knowledge, oh, okay. which is a, maybe maybe not true either, but a different claim. Yeah, uh, no, I think there's like a lot of confusion, right? Like, um, you know, what does absolute truth mean? And people are like, I don't know, like maybe maybe they think it means certainty, but I don't think that they clearly think that. Rather, I think they're just confusing multiple different concepts, like they're confusing certainty with um, objectivity, right? Objectivity is like being independent of observers, right? And, you know, certainty is having 100% probability. So those are just completely different properties. I think people are just confusing those with each other. Um, Anyway, you know, can anything be certain? I don't know, like um, two plus two equals four is certain. I think that's, (laughs) I exist, that's certain, certain to me, right? Maybe not certain to you. My my introspection is that my existence or some kind of sensation that I'm having feels certain. Sometimes I think that like logical truisms or ma- simple mathematical facts seem certain to me. But I, I feel like coupled with the 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 idea that it makes sense to me is also some feeling of like understanding. I, I could imagine having that feeling uh, foisted upon me in a dream or or by some kind of radical confusion or something. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's just, just shy of certainty for me. 
I can't conceive of a way I could be mistaken entirely about the fact that I'm having any experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you can have a feeling of certainty and be mistaken. So that's surely true, right? Almost certainly yeah. true. <laughs> um, right. But, you know, can it be, can you be mistaken that you exist? So no, you could not. Right? Um, it doesn't seem that way. What's the difference between relativism and skepticism? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, that's sort of, I mean, it's sort of what we were just talking about, right? Because, I mean, the skeptics say that you don't, you don't know a lot of stuff that you think you know, or I mean, things that are commonly regarded as knowledge that we don't really know. Um, the most extreme skeptics say that nobody knows anything. And uh, more, you know, a little bit less extreme skeptics say, well, we don't know anything about the external world. Right. Or, you know, like we don't know stuff about the world outside of our own minds, right, which is a more popular form of skepticism. The official relativist view, if you're using the term properly, is not that it's that something can be true relative to a person and be false relative to a different person. You know, whatever, whatever that, what would means. that mean exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. Like, what does that mean? How, how could that be? Right. You can try to give try to give some kind of explanations like. I mean, what the, there are particular truths for which that seems to make sense. Like I say, Stephen Colbert is funny and you go, not to me. And so maybe we both spoke truly, right? Like maybe Stephen Colbert is funny. Maybe that's true for me, but not true for you. Okay. And so you can, you can understand what that means. It means like it yeah. provokes amusement in one person, but not the other. But like, the, how do you generalize that to all truths, right? Even with that example, I could agree that Stephen Colbert is funny to you. Yeah. Or I could agree that Stephen Colbert provokes amusement in Michael Humor. That's like, right, yeah. That, that maybe that's the fact that we're talking about. So it's not really true that that fact is true for you, but is not true for me. No, that's right. Yeah. I mean, what's actually happening is the sentence has different meanings, right? Like Because some of the words specifically are relative in the sense that they are relative to the speaker. Yeah. So like the reference of a word can clearly be relative. That's, you know, uh, that's uncontroversial. And that happens, you know, frequently, like the word I, the word here, the word now, all of those shift their reference depending on who says it, where and when, you know, but the real question is, if you fix what the sentence means, then is the truth of that relative? So, and it's hard to see how it could be, right? Yeah, it's never fully made sense to me. And I think you, you, it was heartening to read your book because I think sometimes you go through perspectives that, I don't know, to me seem crazy. You go through and you either, sometimes, you know, you can, you can reference what a, a sympathetic philosopher has written about it. And sometimes you just say, it's not clear what this would mean. Here are some, here are the most plausible explanations I can think of for what this means. And, and maybe that's the case with a lot of, yeah. positions that are popular with people who think about philosophy somewhat, but maybe not popular with, because you do talk about positions that aren't popular with philosophers, but that are popular with maybe the yeah. lay public thinking about philosophy yeah, in yeah. a confused way. You know, but by the way, like here's, here's uh, the best example that I've heard of truth being relative. Okay. So let's say that I'm a fugitive from the law and, you know, so I'm, I'm hiding away in Denver and, you know, and then I turn on the news and I see this newscaster saying, hey, you know, we don't know where Professor Humor has gone. You know, he might be in Mexico by now. OK, and then so then I say, um, that's false. He said that I might be in Mexico, but I know that I'm in Denver. So it's, you know, I, I def definitely am not in Mexico. So it's false that I might be in Mexico. <laughs> so but to them, relative to their knowledge, yeah. that statement is true. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like the new the newscaster I guess correctly assesses his statement as true, but I I maybe correctly assess it as false. So, you know, truth is relative to the observer. I haven't run through any arguments to make it like clear in my head. I, it doesn't seem crazy that some maybe some truths might be relative in that kind of way. Yeah. Whether truths is not I, when people say that they don't believe in objective truth. Here's a question. You talk about objective truth as a truth being true or a state of the world or a fact being true irrespective of some observer or you know per the, some perceiving agent is that about right yeah can you think of 
philosophers or writers who talk about the not, you know, they're not being objective truth and, and actually seem to mean something like things pop into existence with the presence of an observer and pop out of existence without an observer. Yeah, I mean, you might think of the idealist philosophers, right? <laughs> who So who thought that the only things that exist are minds and ideas or, you know, sort of like things in the mind, right? So, you know, like Barclay's view was that uh, tables are really just collections of our ideas or something, right? And he's using the word idea in a very broad way that we don't normally use it, but, you know, just like some kind of mental state, right? So like the, the table is a collection of, this um, hardness and you know, certain color sensation, whatever. But th those things are all just sensations, not uh, not you know independently existing physical features, right? So yeah, there were there were people who thought that that was actually like the dominant view in the 19th century. I think that was a really popular view really? among philosophers. Yeah, like the world is all mental. You know, it sounds crazy, and is this it? kind of undermines your trust in the field of philosophy. What's the connection between that kind of view and? various skeptical thought experiments like brain in the vat or I know people who talk about those don't necessarily believe those to be true but it seems like there's a family resemblance to thinking that we all live in a purely mental or idealistic world yeah not in the sense of being like an ideal but yeah in the, in the sense you were talking yeah, about yeah. In the specialized sense is that similar where yeah. to yeah I mean those the, kinds of thought experiments yeah in fact like you know when Barclay was writing he was like um I, I guess people would accuse him of being a skeptic Right. And then so, you know, in his in his dialogues, he has like a, one of the characters accused the other character of being a skeptic. And then if they, he accuses the idealist of being a skeptic. The idealist explains that, no, I'm not a skeptic because, you know, I'm not in doubt about whether there are material objects. I definitely know there's no matter. Right? So You're the skeptic of idealism. He could turn it around and say, well, yeah. you're the one who's yeah, skeptical yeah. of my, you know, this is just a framing issue. But, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, neither of them was skeptical because they both were firmly convinced of their views, right? Yes, that's true. Okay. But, you know, there is some, there's some connection because, you know, like one of the, one of the arguments for idealism might be, or one of the arguments is, you know, if you think that there's an external world that's independent of us, then you have to explain how we know about it. And like, if there's no account of how you would know about these things, then maybe you shouldn't be positing them. Can you wait? Can you explain that again? I'm not sure if I caught that. Yeah. So, you know, like traditional realists, uh, you know, the opposition is between realism and skepticism, where the realists think that there are physical, the physical world is independent of the mind. Right. And so like an argument for idealism is that, well, if you're a realist, then you have to explain how we know about the external world. And it's really hard to explain that. You, you know, the realist has to confront the skeptic and give an answer to them. And the idealist doesn't have to give an answer to the skeptic. Right. Because he's not claiming that we know about these mind independent objects. OK. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. So if the skeptic is faced with if the, can you can you explain the brain in the vat hypothesis? Yeah, what I'm talking about if the skeptic is, is faced with that there or if the idealist is faced with the brain in the vat thought experiment, they have a different out potentially? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, like according to modern science, your experiences are caused by stuff happening in your brain. And so you could imagine scientists of perhaps the not too distant future are keeping a brain alive in a vat of nutrients and like there are a whole bunch of wires attached to the brain to stimulate it in exactly the pattern that a brain gets stimulated when it is perceiving the physical world normally, right? And like they can scan the brain to see what kinds of intentions the brain is doing and how it's attempting to move its its body that it thinks it has and so mm -hmm. that they can modify the simulation you know to make it look like the brain is moving the way that it thinks it is so that you could create a a in theory create a perfect illusion right create a perfect virtual reality uh, and so then and you know like maybe maybe these scientists of the future would create this uh, simulation of somebody listening to a podcast, you know, with some weird philosopher talking about a brain in a vat scenario. And so they could just <laughs> like have a chuckle when the person thinks, oh, that's ridiculous. Right? So anyway, so then the question is, how do you know you're not a brain in a vat right now? Or some analog of that, because that's, that's just like one, you know, or a computer program where you talk about, yeah. you know, the possibility of, of dreaming or just being deceived in some important way by a super advanced alien hypnotist or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's different variants on this, you know, more popular recently is um, to hypothesize that maybe we are uh, simulated beings, like all reality is a computer simulation and we're just like, you know, computer programs, parts of the computer program that are simulated people. Yeah. The version I heard is that 
if if you believe that our technological progress will, will continue, it's plausible to think that at some point in 100, 200, 300 years, we could have the technology to do that, to create a conscious being and simulate it in a something like a computer program. And like modern video games, you might be fun to make movies or recreations of interesting historical times. Well, the, this is an interesting historical time. Uh, what are the chances that we happen to be the real pen, you know, 2020 pandemic era civilization rather than one of the dozen simulations made 500 years from now? Yeah. And some people seem to actually believe this. Yeah. I mean, you're you're going you go over it in in the book in a way that feels tell me tell me if this is not your perspective that these are interesting thought experiments that you hear and they sound scary they sound obviously wrong but it's not obvious where to poke a hole in them and that makes you want to stop and say okay what what's going wrong in our thinking or maybe something's not going wrong in our thinking and that's just a a real possibility is is that the way you think about it yeah i mean you know like these are like the reason why I'm I talk about these things is not that oh you know maybe maybe we're in a simulation or maybe we're brains of that. <laughs> That's not really the reason. The reason is to think about the concept of knowledge, right? Because it's surprisingly hard to explain how you know about the external world, and like you can construct these arguments that have like there's plausibility to all of the premises, and then they entail that you don't know anything about the external world. So what you want to do is like figure out you know what went wrong. Like, you know, where, where is the inconsistency in my belief system? You know, I have beliefs, I have beliefs about knowledge that entail that I don't know anything about the external world, but I also think that I know lots of things about the external world. So you want to try to like, you know, fix your belief system to make it more coherent. You went through several arguments against these kinds of thought experiments and some, I was reading them and sometimes thinking like, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense, but I, I don't feel the pull of it. The only the first one that I read and I was wondering if you could go, if you could describe it, that I felt an intuitive like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's why I'm not a brain in a fat was Moore's argument. Yeah. Am I remembering the name? Yeah. Do you know and it? maybe that's just subjective to me that that one felt punchy and strong or, or maybe it felt like it threw into relief, like why it's silly to entertain a really crazy hypothetical like that when it's inconsistent with other beliefs. Can you can you explain what that argument or what that type of argument does? Yeah, I mean, so there, like there's a type of response to skeptical arguments that can be applied to like a wide range of crazy philosophical arguments um, known as the Morian response, the more the GE Moore shift, right? By the way, like yeah, that's right. Yeah, on the on the internet you can find like a song about the GE Moore shift. Right, by the 21st century monads. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Yeah, but so let's say somebody gives an argument for um, skepticism, right? So let's say the argument is, you know, if you know that you have two hands, then you must know that you're not a brain of that. It's the first premise. Second premise, you don't know you're not a brain of that. Conclusion, you don't know you have two hands, right? And, you know, D.E. Moore notes that, so, well, there are three propositions that are incompatible with each other that are all plausible, Right. One, I don't know I'm not a brain of that. Two, I know I have two hands. Three, if I know I have two hands, then I know I'm not a brain of that. So those three are jointly incompatible. The skeptic picks two of them and rejects the third. Okay, but you could pick a different two and reject a different one, right? And so, right, so, there, so this is a valid argument. I know I have two hands. If I know I have two hands, then I know I'm not a brain of that. Therefore, I know I'm not a brain of that, right? Or, you know, another one like, I know I have two hands. Uh, I don't know I'm not a brain of that. Therefore, it's false that if I know I have two hands, then I know I'm not a brain of that. Because like you can make any of these, you can make any of these three arguments. The skeptic just picks one of them. So like, what's the, what's the most rational thing, right? What's the most rational conclusion to draw? Well, um, you should probably reject the least plausible of the three, of the three propositions, right? You shouldn't reject the most plausible. And basically, the skeptic is the person who rejects the most obvious of the three propositions, right? That's why that's not why you call it the more shift, because it's kind of shifting a burden of proof or shifting who needs to explain something in this situation. Like, why accept this bizarre counterfactual? Well, I, maybe it's not fair to call it a counterfactual. Yeah. Uh, this bizarre thought experiment, as opposed to rejecting something or accepting something simpler. 
I don't know if mm-hmm. I, I'm not explaining it yeah. well, but it it threw it into sharper relief for me than the other arguments against it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like maybe a, um, you know, more intuitive explanation is um, I sometimes give this example, like you're doing a, um, you're doing a problem in your physics class and, you know, they, you have to work out the circumference of the earth from some data. Okay. And so you work out the problem and then you get the result that the earth is uh, 80 miles around. And the circumference is 80 miles. Okay. Sensible. <laughs> okay. And then, you think to yourself, huh, I didn't think it was that small, you know? And then you check over your calculation again and you can't find the error. Now, is this a realistic scenario? Yes, that happened, you know, like stuff like that happened. I made mistakes, you know, very frequently when I was in classes and whatever. So, you know, I got unreasonable answers. So, okay, and so what's the rational response? Is the rational response, oh, well, surprising, I guess the earth is smaller than I thought. Or as a rational response, I made a mistake and I can't find where, but I still know it's a mistake. That's the rational response, right? And like, similarly, if you're going through some reasoning and you come to the conclusion, I don't know if I have hands or not, you should think <laughs> I made a mistake. Even right? maybe I Even don't- Even if you don't know where and you yeah. can't identify it, yeah. that makes more sense than just concluding that you don't really have hands. Yeah, or you know, you don't know if you do, right? That makes sense. I'm going to back up a little bit. Something you talk about at the beginning of your book, one criticism of philosophy, like why why read about philosophy? Why read a book about philosophy? And you know, maybe maybe you're intrinsically interested in it, but is there some important reason? Aren't you just reading a bunch of ideas of old people that have stayed the same for a thousand years and it never makes progress? And like contemporary biologists and physicists would never read Aristotle for genuine insights, but for some reason, contemporary philosophers do. So clearly philosophy is just kind of dead in the water and not making progress. But you have a, you have a different perspective on that. So what's your, <laughs> yeah. what's your perspective on the progress of philosophy? Yeah, no, I mean, philosophy have made, has made plenty of progress. So, you know, like speaking of Aristotle, you know, like um, Aristotle thought that slavery was a good idea and that it was just because, you know, some people are just natural born slaves. And uh, actually, a lot of people thought that throughout human history. And today, basically, nobody thinks that. And that's that's progress, right? And like you might think, oh yeah, but that's obvious, that's trivial, who cares, right? But the thing is, like that's how it seems when you make the progress. <laughs> like once you've completed the progress, then the earlier view sounds ridiculous. So then you know you sort of like don't appreciate it. But this is actually a super important thing, right? And there are multiple things that are like that. So um, you know, like Plato thought that democracy was a terrible idea and that you should have dictatorship by philosopher kings, you know, basically. <laughs> and uh, nobody thinks that anymore, right? And, you know, like these were a couple of the greatest philosophers of all time, right? The, so with those examples and maybe others like that, is there is there reason to think that that's progress due to philosophy or just progress about philosophical conclusions due to other factors? It could be difficult to trace it exactly, right? Is it, you know, there's a there will be a general shift in the culture and, you know, you don't know, like, how much of this was due to the philosophers going around blabbing and, you know, trying to tell people, hey, you're wrong about stuff. Sure. Um, you know, like, uh, we know we know something about why we abolished slavery, right? Why the United States abolished slavery? Well, there was this abolitionist movement. There were all these people working to abolish it. And, like, there were all these people who said that we should stop doing this, and they said why. And the reason was that they thought it was unjust, that it was violating people's rights and stuff like that. So it was like explicitly philosophical, right? It was, it was an ethical motive, you know, for um, for abolishing slavery. Yeah, that seems right. If you push that back a step further and ask why, you know, why in all this time did it take so long for any any even semi-decent anti-slavery movement to form, you know, what explains that? I mean, maybe that's not fair to just keep pushing it back because you've, you've, you've named a clearly philosophical motive. But even that seems like it could plausibly be philosophical, like the spread of ideas with, you know, books becoming and literacy becoming more popular and people understanding, I don't know, different human perspectives. Yeah. You know, like um, a lot of this stuff seems obvious to us now. And a lot of the things that people were doing in the past just seems stupid. Um, but, you know, what, <laughs> uh, that's that's the way it was. So, 
you know, like in the Middle Ages, they thought that uh, torturing people was a good way of finding out information. So like torturing somebody until they confess to a crime, that was a good way of verifying that they committed the crime. And like, that's just so stupid. In addition to being barbaric, right? like, you know, in addition yeah. to the intrinsic awfulness of torture was also just a, like a really dumb idea. At some point, people figured out that this doesn't work, you know, and this is not a good idea. What about in non-moral subfields of psychology? Uh, philosophy. Progress that's been made over, or sorry, yeah. What did I say? Yeah. Philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, outside of outside of moral and political philosophy, um, you know, I mean, like, of course, there's been progress in logic. So, that, you know, we started out with Aristotle's logic like 2,000 years ago, and that was the received logic for a couple thousand years. But there's there's now um, more sophisticated logical systems, starting with Frege. So, with a you know, like past 150 years or something like that. Yeah. What else? I mean, there are a lot of theories that we're talking about today that just were not even talked about in the past. So uh, like functionalist theories and philosophy of mind, like, you know, like Plato and Aristotle did not have any such things, which is, which is the dominant view, not my view, but is, is the orthodox view in philosophy of mind today is functionalism. Um, so, you know, like if you think that's a good view, that's progress, right? You might think, uh, it's progress, even if it isn't true, because like at least we've sort of identified more possible views. You know, like uh, maybe about the free will issue. Um, I think, you know, like uh, if you think compatibilism is a good view, then that's progress. That's so. OK, so let's talk about free will. What is compatibilism and can you make it sound not crazy? Yeah, so I mean, it's the idea that free will is compatible with determinism. So you can have free will even though everything is predetermined. And when I first say this, some people like uh, try to misunderstand it to be saying something that's um, obviously true. Right? <laughs> Students sometimes try to reinterpret it to be something that's trivially true instead of something that seems um, absurd. Right. What would be trivially true about it? Yeah, so like students interpret it to mean, well, maybe some actions are predetermined and other actions are free. No, oh. that's not their view. Their view is every action is completely predetermined and also some of them are still free. It's still, you still have a choice about what happens even though it's completely predetermined. Okay, now, so to most people that sounds contradictory. If that didn't sound contradictory, then you didn't understand what I said, <laughs> right? But anyway, like, um, yeah, why, why would people think this? And so like they try to give explanations of how this would be true and there are semantic explanations. So they give explanations of what the word can means or what the word free means. So uh, maybe say, maybe I can do X just means if I tried to do X, I would succeed or something like that. If it means anything like that, then it's compatible with determinism that I can do multiple things. Like there could be- But there just is only one series of things that you will try to do. Yeah, right. I will do only one thing and that could be determined by the past and the laws of nature in advance. But it's true that if I tried to do something else, I would have succeeded. It's just that I'm not going to try to do something else because, you know, like the past and laws of nature have determined that I won't try to do the other thing. But if I did, I would succeed. So I could do the other thing in that sense. Right. OK. And then you have to have an argument about whether that's really what can means. Aren't you saying in that case that it's it's impossible for you to try to do something else? Well, um, if you say, oh, what does it mean? OK, what you know, can you try to do something different from what you actually try to do? What does that mean? Then they say, well, that means that if I tried to try to do something else, then I would try <laughs> to do something else. That could also be true. <laughs> like you, if you could just iterate this, they could all be true. Yeah. Right? Um, but still true that you know only one course of events is consistent with the past and the laws of nature. Anyway, and then a, like a related thing, see if you find this more plausible. A related thing that they like to say is, you know, to be free means. Um, that your actions are caused by internal causes, by your own desires and beliefs or something, and not by external forces. And so you can give some examples that make this sound plausible, right? Like uh, this dialogue that I got from the compatibilist philosopher, W.T. Stace. So like, you know, he imagined somebody saying, I once went without food for a week. And then you say, did you do that of your own free will? And then the person says one of the following things. Yes, uh, you know, I did it because I was on a hunger strike. 
you know, to uh, to get the British government to leave India. <laughs> okay, well, that makes sense. Or imagine the person saying, no, I didn't do it of my own free will. I did it because I was uh, lost in the desert and I couldn't find any food. And like both of those sound natural, right? Yeah. And notice that the difference is not, the person doesn't say, yes, I did it for no reason whatsoever. Right. They say yes, and then they cite the explanation, but the explanation appeals to their own values and beliefs or something. And then in the other case where they say, I didn't do it of my own free will, they appeal to external constraints. All right. And so maybe the real difference between free and unfree actions is like not whether they're caused, but how they're caused. If they're caused by your own values, desires, goals, whatever, versus external constraints that prevent you from doing what you want. And in that explanation, I mean, it, it, that's an explanation that's trying to rescue free will as a concept. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, it so. seems like it seems like it gets you a pretty impoverished view of free will. Or in that case, what's what is special or interesting about the concept of free will as opposed to other things? It's just say, it's like I could come up with a special word for things that are caused internally by my computer's programming. It's yeah. not caused by me. If I push it, that's external. But if the program is causing stuff to happen internally. That's yeah, yeah. computer will. It just seems like I'm making up a special word. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So notice that on this account of free will, there's no obstacle to robots having free will. And you might think that that is um, maybe that's a counter. Maybe that's a counter example. Like, right? Like intuitively, you know, you have a robot that is completely following this algorithm, and it always follows the algorithm. <laughs> you might think that is not a plausible case for free will, but it could be true that if the robot had tried to do something else, it would have succeeded. It could be true that the robot's action is caused by, you know, internal states that represent goals and, you know, representations of the world within the robot's computer brain or whatever. So, I mean, you can understand why we would want to make a distinction between actions that are explained by uh, internal causes versus external causes. Like somebody, um, somebody killed another person, it matters if that was because they wanted to kill the other person. I think it matters to whether we should punish them or not. And so like, it matters to what we should expect to happen in the future with that person. No, it, it does matter. And, and I, I maybe intuitively the reason it seems like I would want to draw a distinction or about free will as opposed to other kinds of causation is because internally it subjectively feels like I could do one of multiple things and I'm I'm choosing things and I feel constrained by the external world. I also feel constrained by my own thoughts and, and goals, but I don't feel constrained in the same way. It feels like there's a range of real things that I might do. Like there are things I know I would never do, but I might take a drink of my watermelon sparkling water right now. Yeah. Or I might not. And that feels like I could have gone either way on that. And it was my choice. Yeah. And I didn't do it because it seemed funnier not to do it after I picked it up. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or maybe maybe for no reason, right? Like maybe for no those reason. Those were equally good options. Yeah. I mean, so why do we believe in free will? Like one reason is it just kind of seems like, you know, very, very frequently in normal life, it seems like you could do either of two things or multiple things. I want to jump into a little bit on the section on ethics but before that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the epistemology section. And I haven't said, can you say briefly what epistemology means? It's a weird word that most people don't know. Yeah, you know, it's a branch of philosophy that addresses philosophical questions about knowledge. Like, what is knowledge? And how do we know the things that we know? Or do we, in fact, know the things we think we know? And stuff like that. So related to progress in philosophy, you've got a long section. Tell me if I've got the history wrong about attempts to define what knowledge is. And maybe this isn't exactly, you know, super big progress, but it it sounds like there was a relatively accepted definition of knowledge until, what, 1963 or something? And, yeah. and then everything went haywire and no one yeah. can come up with a good definition. And the point of the that set, well, I'll let you say what the point of that section really is, but yeah. can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so the traditional definition of knowledge was knowledge is justified true belief. So you know something to be the case if it is the case and you believe that it is and you have adequate justification for your belief, right? And then it's okay, so apparently that was the received view, although I can't find that many statements of it in print, 
But I believe the philosophers who were around then when they say that was their seed view. Um, and then, you know, in 1963, Edmund Gettier comes up with this counterexample. People usually don't like Gettier's examples because they're very artificial. So I will give a different example that most people like better. Right? The clock example? <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking at a clock. It says three o'clock. So I believe justifiably that it's three o'clock because that's how you normally find out the time. And um, let's say, you know, this is an analog clock. OK, so it can be sitting there um, indicating three o'clock when it's actually not working. Right. So suppose that coincidentally the clock is not working, but, you know, coincidentally, it is actually three o'clock at the time that I look at it. So, OK, so it's three o'clock. I believe it's three o'clock and I'm justified in believing it. Do I know what time it is? Then most people intuitively respond, no, I, I don't know the time. I don't know it's three o'clock, right? But I have a justified true belief. So that shows that justified true belief is not sufficient for knowledge, right? So, okay. And then, you know, so Gettier gave different examples that are more artificial, that are things that you wouldn't actually ever think, um, but, but, you know, make the same point. And then, you know, basically everyone agreed that that refuted the traditional definition. So you could say this is a kind of progress because, you know, we found out that something was false that people used to think. Um, and then after that, for like the next, you know, few decades, people tried to fix the definition. They tried to give different definitions that would not have any counterexamples and nobody succeeded. There are a few people who claim to have succeeded, but, you know, in, like there's no generally accepted definition. Every definition has what most people would regard as good counterexamples. What? Wow. Oh, that's terrible. You know, we made a we made a significant amount of progress in discovering a bunch of theories were false. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that's disappointing. I mean, part of the reason why I talk about this is that, you know, you should reflect on the nature of concepts and definitions. You know, we should think like what we should learn something from this episode. Right. And this, by the way, is not special to knowledge. This is typical. This is typical of, of virtually any concept, almost all concepts outside of mathematics. Um, if you try to define them, a philosopher can come up with counterexamples. Philosophers are good at this sort of thing. And so like actually in the history of philosophy, I think there is no generally accepted definition of anything. And so, uh, yeah, you know, what does that mean? I mean, and then sometimes people say, oh my God, so we don't know what anything means. That's obviously false. <laughs> so like, you know, that is a reductio ad absurdum of the assumption that understanding meaning means knowing the definition. Right. Understanding yeah. the meaning of a word is not knowing a definition. That's what we learn from this, right? Because like, you know, you've learned thousands of words in your life. And, you know, especially during the first few years of life and almost none of them were defined. Like in almost no case did somebody tell you what the word meant. What happened was you just observed it being used, right? So part of what we should learn about about definitions, like we should learn that there's actually there's definitions of hardly anything, a very small percentage of terms in language. And that's not how people learn concepts. At least not like perfectly adequate with necessary and sufficient conditions, yeah. kinds of definitions. Yeah. I mean, you know, like most words you can look up in the dictionary and it will say something, <laughs> right? It will say something, but in most cases, what it will say does not satisfy philosopher's standards for definition. In some cases, it's just a synonym. And in other cases, um, you know, there will be a description, but a philosopher could think of counterexamples. Probably as an exercise to the listener, you, you could probably look up any, you could look up the word desk in a dictionary and probably come up with your own counterexample that fits the definition, but obviously isn't a desk. I'm going to try that after this podcast. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, that, that's a good exercise, right? Like just take any concept and try to try to define it. Like here's an example. What's a table? Okay, well, I don't know. It's a piece of furniture that has got, um, you know, a flat level surface on top and then some supports, you know, does it, and it's designed for holding smaller objects on top of it or something. Like, okay, so then a bed is a table because, you know, right? The bed <laughs> has a flat level surface designed to hold a smaller object. Okay. Oh, so a bed isn't a table. Then you're like, okay, well, modify it. Uh, it's designed for holding other objects, not people. Okay, well, what about an operating table? That's a table, but it is designed to hold people. <laughs> like, you know, you can go yeah. on. It's like, well, you know, why is it like this? Because um, 
we don't really have a need to form concepts that are redundant. So like, um, if there if there was a short description that was equivalent to table, there would be less need for the concept table. The reason we have the concept table is that like other concepts don't do the same thing. <laughs> right? And like having a definition requires there to be, you know, a, a collection of other concepts that somehow get exactly the same contours. But there's no reason to assume that that is generally possible. Right. So, you know, like a collection of other concepts where you can take the intersections and unions and whatever and get exactly the same collection of objects. When you say it the way you just said it, I don't think it's probably surprising to most people that, you know, having a perfectly nitpicky, conceptually airtight definition of things is tricky and maybe not always possible or doable. That doesn't sound crazy, but it's still really surprising when you go through that chapter. And the way you the way you do it, like going through example by example, it's I could picture doing that in a in a philosophy class, as, you know, giving the students the challenge. OK, here's the new example. Come up with counterexamples. Mm-hmm. All right. We got to come up with a new new definition now and and then challenge it. Have everyone try to pick that one apart and it wouldn't be terribly difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And every time you suggest every time you go through a new one in the book, you know, my initial thought is, oh, that's pretty good. And then, oh, no, that's obvious. There's yeah. a, that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you need a certain amount of uh, experience and training to be good at making counterexamples. Because if you do this with students, like frequently they will say a counterexample that doesn't really work, like, or or they'll say one that's like really controversial, that like presupposes some controversial view that the student has or something. Or that's just like wildly, dis- maybe it works, but it's wildly distracting and confusing. Right, yeah, that, that's yeah, that's the thing that frequently happens. Like, um, you know, people will just like rate they'll give something that's sort of on the topic, but this raises some huge other issue, right? Which you don't really want to do. Well, on that note, what's the purpose of hypotheticals in philosophy? And why do so many people seem to have such a hard time uh, accepting and reasoning with hypotheticals? Yeah, I mean, you know, so this thing about, um, the thing about defining concepts is related to why we use hypothetical examples. Um, In my view, understanding a concept is not knowing a description of the concept. Rather, understanding a concept is having appropriate dispositions. So uh, when when you learn a word, you try to imitate other people's use of the word, which means you're you try to use it in circumstances that feel similar to the circumstances in which you've seen the word used in the past. And when you get the appropriate dispositions to apply the word, that's when you understand the concept. So like I understand the concept of knowledge when I have the dispositions to call something knowledge that roughly match the dispositions of people in my speech community. Okay, and so um, and so like the way to access your concept and like you know get the correct contours of it is not to ask the person or to ask yourself for a description of it. The way to sort of access the concept is to imagine concrete scenarios, like as if you were encountering this particular case, and then see whether you feel disposed to apply the word knowledge. Right? Like having the disposition to have in linguistic intuitions about cases, that's what the concept consists in. And you can't necessarily directly introspectively observe your dispositions, but what you could do is like activate them by describing a particular scenario. And say, oh, does this work? Would I, if, if this happened, would I say, yes, I know this to be true. Yeah. I have knowledge in this case. Yeah. So, you know, like, so this is one of the reasons why we do hypothetical scenarios, right? And so, and for this purpose, it does not matter if the scenario is realistic. Like, we're not saying that these things are going to happen. That doesn't matter. Right? Like, and that, that fact seems to d- divide people. There just seems to be a type of person. I don't, I think it's a psychological difference who is just really p- off put by the use of hypotheticals in general, but especially unrealistic or bizarre hypotheticals. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's just that it's too distracting. Like the, the, there's a point of the hypothetical to focus your attention on the you know philosophically relevant point you're trying to explore. But if I give you a hypothetical that is a bizarre science fiction scenario involving brains and vats, that's just going to distract me and make me. My first reaction is, what the hell does that have to do with anything? That's so unrealistic. Not my first reaction, yeah. but <laughs> a lot of people's. Yeah. No. I mean, like one thing you might think is, well thinking about a scenario that doesn't happen, how could that tell us about the actual world? <laughs> um, 
because, you know, you're just like, you have premises that are about some alternative weird possibility. How can such premises legitimately lead to a conclusion about the real world? Um, but uh, in fact, they can, right? <laughs> like you can easily think of valid arguments that start from hypothetical premises, right? So like if A, then if B, then C, but not if B, then C, therefore not A, right? <laughs> right, you know, both hypothetical, both, you know, conditional premises. Part of why it's useful is that you're trying to understand a concept, or like this is one thing that you might be trying to do, trying to understand a concept, also trying to understand the reasons for things, right? And so like you can test a claim about like the reason why A is true is B. You can test that by imagining other situations in which B is still true, and then asking whether A would still be true. And it doesn't matter if those other situations were actual or not, or realistic. Somebody says, yeah, you know, like the, the reason why um, it's okay to, um, to torture and kill animals for food is that we're a lot smarter than them. And then I say, okay, so if that's true, then if there were an alien species that shows up on earth and they're a lot smarter than us, it'd be fine for them to torture and kill us. And so it doesn't matter that there isn't such a species, right? The point is like, the claim about the reason why we get to do something implies something about other situations that haven't actually happened. And the hypothetical is supposed to focus your attention on the morally or philosophically relevant details yeah. and not on extraneous details. And yeah, right. Yeah. That- sometimes you need um, an un- sometimes you need an unrealistic hypothetical in order to get rid of um, details that exist in the actual world that are distracting you from the issue, right? I think about it like a scientific drawing. I remember being in high school and learning how to make a scientific illustration. And one of the points was, don't be super detailed if you are if you are like a biologist or and if you're out in nature and you're trying to draw a new species or something like that, there's no reason to get into super nitty gritty details of drawing, like, say, the dirt that it's on. You want to you want to just give a, a rough outline so that someone can get the, the important points of what you're trying to convey. Too much detail distracts you from yeah. from the purpose. And if you look in a science book and you look at scientific illustrations, they're relatively simple line drawings. I mean, they look good, but I don't know, that's how I think of philosophical hypotheticals. Yeah, no, that seems right. I want to jump in just just for a little bit to the the last section. Well, not the last section, second to last section on ethics in the book. Can you just talk a little bit about the difference between you have uh, you go over consequentialist theories, ethical theories, and deontological ethical theories. What's the difference between consequentialism and deontology? Yeah, so, you know, consequentialists think that the right action is always the action that produces the best consequences, you know, maximize the good. Um, A a popular slogan is the ends justify the means. You know, like any any action could be justified if it produces sufficiently good consequences. Uh, And the deontologists are just not consequentialists. Deontologists just think that's not the case. No, um, does no. Vir- is, does virtue ethics? I don't think you had a section on virtue ethics. Does that fit into deontology um, in the way you just described it? I mean, yeah, I guess it counts as deontological the way I just defined it. Yeah, the vir- virtue ethics is supposed to be a third alternative, but I'm not sure that there in fact is a third alternative. <laughs> I, I mean, like the reason why people think this is well, like there are three ethical, con- three important ethical concepts, um, like good, right, and virtue. And like the consequentialists are the people who think the concept of good is primary and you can derive what's right or what's virtuous from premises about what's good. And then the deontologists think that the concept of rightness or you know concept ought to do is primary. And then the virtue theorists think that the concept of virtue is primary. Okay, but I don't myself think this is a great way of thinking about it. I'm a deontologist, but it's not exactly, I think that concept of right is primary. Um, But I think the right thing isn't always the thing that maximizes the good. But, you know, like to get a sense of why there's an issue here, you know, so uh, so here's a story. Um, You're in a hospital and you have like five patients who need organ transplants and you've got this one healthy patient and, you know, he's got five organs. And so if you kill the healthy patient, you could like take his organs and transplant them into five other people and save five lives. Like, so should you do that? <laughs> right? And like, and this is used as a counterexample to consequentialism because it's like, oh, well, you'd kill one person, but you'd say five, five is greater than one, right? So isn't that good overall? So you should do that, right? 
And, uh, and here's a perfect opportunity to ruin a perfectly good hypothetical by asking yeah. if the person you're sacrificing is a murderer. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what people often do to sort of like, you know, derail the, the conversation. Right. Uh, so let me stipulate all of the people in the example are normal people. None of them is Hitler and none of them is the person who's going to discover the cure for cancer or anything. Darn. Just regular average people. Yeah. So, you know, like most people's uh, intuitive reaction is like, no, obviously you can't do that. Right. And so then deontologists say, so that shows you that you shouldn't always maximize the good. Don't always do the thing with the best overall consequences. Right. Like there are some moral constraints on how you're allowed to treat other people, even if you would be producing more good overall. At some point you say you're, you, you just said you're a deontologist or, or one of a soft deontologist. Uh, yeah. you, you had a distinction. But you mentioned that you're not a utilitarian in the book, but that you've grown more sympathetic to that view over time. What can you say a little bit about that? Why have you grown more sympathetic to it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, when you when you think about it, like you you see puzzles and you know problems created by common deontological intuitions. You know, th- you think about things like okay, so according to deontologists, like you shouldn't murder one person, even if that would prevent two murders. All right, but suppose that you saw somebody, so you're a like third party observer, you see somebody deciding whether to commit one w- murder to prevent two other murders, you know, however this works, just assume that that could happen. Uh, what would you hope happened? So you know that either one murder will happen or two murders will happen. And you know, as a benevolent person, surely you should hope that only one murder happens. So you should hope that the one person does the thing that on your view is morally wrong. And then, okay, so they, I don't know, that's a little weird. But then, you know, then let's suppose later you get in that same situation. And then it seems like you should hope that you yourself do the thing that you would hope the third party would do. Like when you're the third party observer, you hope the person kills the one. And then if it's you, you should hope that you kill the one. Right? And, and it's, it seems that way. And it then, seems like a, a, a tension, if not yeah. a contradiction. Yeah. And then if you if you should hope that you do it, then shouldn't you just do it? Right? So, yeah. So there's something weird about this, right? You know, another thing, another thing you can say is, yeah, in the deontological view, um, I'm not, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book or not, but in the deontological view, it's possible to have a case in which you um, harm one person, but produce a greater benefit for someone else and the action is morally wrong. That's like essential to being a deontologist that you think that's possible. Okay, so imagine a case in which you harm one per, you, you create one unit of harm to person A and two units of benefit to person B, and it's morally wrong. And then also imagine a second action that creates one unit of harm to person B and two units of harm to person A. Sorry, two units of benefit to person A. Okay, and so each action is wrong, but if you combine the two, then it benefits both people overall. You see what I mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so then it looks like each action is wrong, but the com- combination of both of them is right. And that's kind of paradoxical. Doesn't it just look like each action is wrong on a deontological view, but each action is right on a consequentialist view? Yeah, this is or, or yeah. This is why follow? this is a puzzle for deontology. Yeah, so, you know, you think about that, and you're like, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> And, and utilitarianism tends to solve at least these puzzles while raising some others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, utilitarianism doesn't have any paradoxes like that, right? It just has uncomfortable implications. Yeah. Like, you know, like you kill the healthy patient to harvest the organs. Yes. And some utilitarians bite that bullet and say, yeah, well, I guess that's what you do. I guess, I guess our, not all our moral intuitions are to be trusted. Right. And that sounds grotesque, but... I'll do it. What's the difference between act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism? Oh, uh, the rule. So, yeah, act utilitarianism is the classical version. It's just like, look at all the possible actions open to you at any given time and choose the one that produces the the best consequences. The rule utilitarians say, no, what you should do is like, look at um, systems of rules and you should choose the system of moral rules that would produce the best consequences um, if it were generally accepted or something like that, and then you should follow those rules. You're not looking at the consequences of each individual action. And then the rural utilitarians are supposed to have um, answers to things like the organ harvesting, right? Like they're supposed to think, well, if you have a general rule, don't kill your patients. 
that's better than a general rule that says, you know, I kill patients when you can produce benefit for other patients, more benefit for the other patients. It seems like one, like an issue that occurs to me with rule utilitarianism is that it, is there any, is there any principled way to say like at what level of granularity the rules need to be specified? Because maybe you have a general set of rules that doesn't allow that kind of thing. It doesn't allow murder and that basically recreates, you know, a decent amount of deontological ethics in a certain way. But but one of the stipulations of the rule is that no one's allowed to murder except someone in this exact circumstances who could get away with it <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And then you have a very inelegant set of rules, but that is still slightly maximizes slightly more utility because it allows for this. Yeah. And you could always just add one more silly caveat. Like, is there a principled way to avoid that problem? Or I'm sure it's been addressed. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this would be an objection, right? Like, do you do you allow exceptions in your rules? Like... It could still be like, you know, that exception is part of the general rule. Yeah. So if you say, no, 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 you're not allowed to have except, you're not allowed to have any clause that says except such and such. Okay. You're not allowed to do that. Okay. But then that produces a really implausible view, right? So then now you can't have exceptions to, you know, the rule against killing people. So now like, you, you know, you can't, can't allow killing in self-defense. For self-defense. That's an exception. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're like, okay, you can, you can allow exceptions. And then you're like, okay, so why not have this exception? You know, no killing except if you happen to have five patients who need organ transplants, whatever, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and then you just reproduce the same consequences, act utilitarianism. Okay. Um, so the rule utilitarian would have to have some story about like how the rules get chosen. They might say, well, you have to look at rules that could plausibly be the socially accepted morality of a society, of a nor of like a society made of normal humans or something like that, right? And so, like, um, you know, maybe maybe that requires it to have a certain level of generality. But why appeal? Like, why do they get to appeal to reasons that aren't themselves utilitarian in, in deciding what kinds of rules yeah. fit in with the with rule utilitarianism? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, utility considerations are the only things that you use in comparing the rules to each other, right? And then you're like, okay, but then, you know, how do you decide what rules count? But, you know, like the thought is, well, if they're, if the set of rules is too complicated, then it's going to be infeasible or something like that, which is kind of a legitimate utilitarian consideration, right? That does seem like a legitimate utilitarian consideration and a, and a, and a, just plausible on its face that other things being equal, I've come across this myself. I work with uh, kids with behavioral excesses and deficits, and you're sometimes thinking about, you know, strategies for working with them. And how could I train someone to work with this student in a way that's going to help them the most? And maybe there's some very detailed set of behavioral strategies that would work best, but I'm going to lose out on fidelity of implementation because it's too complicated and the person I'm training will never remember these rules. So better mm -hmm. to go with something simpler that's not in theory quite as good. Yeah, yeah. So now, you know, note that like the act utilitarian would be fine with that, right? <laughs> because like for the act utilitarian would say, oh yeah, well, like when you tell the person what rules to follow, you have to like count the consequences of your telling them that and you're telling them the really complicated rules results in them not actually following those. <laughs> so you have to take that into account when you're calculating the consequences. But the thing is like, you know, the rule utilitarian would say, okay, so like, you know, when we're thinking about what would be the best um, socially accepted morality for a society, you have to count the consequences of having this set of rules in general, even if you yourself could follow the more complicated set of rules. <laughs> Like you don't have to follow the more complicated set of rules if it wouldn't be better for society in general to have that more complicated set of rules, right? Like maybe it would be better if everyone was a lot smarter and more sophisticated, but sure. uh, yeah, right. So like but that those is too, that more complicated set of rules still does in fact happen to be the right thing to do, even if not everyone can do it. Well, no, I mean, the more complicated set of rules would be the right thing if people were different, right? Like, yes. Right, so this is to explain how rule utilitarianism is different from act utilitarianism, right? The act utilitarian goes, okay, well, you know, just like you personally have to do whatever produces the best consequences. And then, you know, you can tell other people something else. You could tell a different set of rules to other people than the ones that you're following because maybe you have different characteristics. Maybe you're smarter or more sophisticated than the other people. I, I certainly am. Yeah. So I have a lot of, there's a lot of exceptions built into my moral rules. 
What dead philosopher's work do you think has the best combination of originality, importance, and truth? Oh, wow. Okay. They have to have truth, too. That's a really hard one. I don't know. They've got to have whatever you think is the optimal mix. They don't have to be maximally all three, but... Yeah. Because, you know, I was going to say Aristotle until he got to the third one. But <laughs> he can have falsity in there, too. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I assume you do think he got some things right. Yeah, I mean, like, well, you know, he did a good job founding logic, you know. <laughs> Non-contradiction. Right, but like the whole, the teleology thing is like pretty ubiquitous in his philosophy. And, it, sure. and then that's just not true. Uh, you know, I like Thomas Reed, but I mean, like, I don't know, is he super, he's not super original, right? Because he's like, you know, he's ma mainly defending direct realism and common sense. So, I don't know, that's not that amazing. Uh, Descartes is pretty great. Um, <laughs> wait, what were the three originality originality, importance, and truth. Oh yeah, maybe it's Descartes. You know, like a, a lot of people would reject this because um, they don't like his dualism, but I, I like the mind-body dualism. <laughs> so that's an important thing. Although I think like he had big epistemological errors. So I'm not sure about that. Probably any answer you give, there's going to be well, some big errors, I, I have to imagine. Yeah, yeah. I said dead, so you wouldn't name yourself. Yeah, but he's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it would clearly be me. <laughs> Because, you know, I, like, wow, I'm right about everything. What are the odds? You know, I can't find a single mistake, you know, in humor's work. Um, no, but, you know, like, so Descartes is super important. He's often referred to as the founder of modern philosophy, where, you know, by modern, we mean like, you know, since the 1700s or since the 1600s, right? That's what counts as modern. Does the word modern in philosophy have, is the same, like, historical referent as in history? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure how historians use modern. There's like three, I think there are like three events that roughly all kind of ring in the modern era. It's like the, the Columbus landing in the new world, the fall of the Eastern Roman empire and the Protestant reformation. Oh, okay. All kind of hit within like 50 years of each other or something. And are supposed to ring in the modern era around 1500 ish. Oh, okay. So I guess that's consistent with what I know of philosophers using the first the first of the moderns is Descartes in, you know, history of philosophy classes. You know, we have ancient history where you do Plato, Aristotle, and, you know, sometimes the weird other guys. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then you have medieval philosophy where you do Aquinas and a bunch of weird other people. And then you do modern philosophy where you start with Descartes and then, you know, go up through Kant, I think. Okay, I'm going to ask you the same question, but just about moral philosophy. Still has to be dead. Im important, original, and accurate. W.D. Ross? So, yeah, so he's an intuitionist, um, ethical intuitionist, and uh, also a, he has the right form of deontology in, by my lights. Um, so he's, he's And a, you have a book called Ethical Intuitionism, t taking some inspiration from Ross? Uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, yeah, so Ross has this book called The Right and the Good, in which, you know, he defends his intuitionism and also his views about just, you know, what's right, where he... He's a pluralistic moderate deontologist, meaning he thinks there are multiple different things that you have some prima facie obligation to do, i.e. you're obligated to do these things if they don't conflict with one of the other prima facie duties. And, um, you know, and then in the case of a conflict, you sort of have to weigh them and intuitively judge which is more important in the circumstances. So he's like, oh, well, you have to, uh, you know, you should keep your promises again, you know, but not like not absolutely, you should keep your promises if there's no very strong reason not to do it, but sometimes there is, right? You should not tell lies. Uh, you should help other people when you're in a position to do so easily. You should not cause harm to other people, et cetera, right? So there's just a list of these things that you should generally do if they don't conflict with anything else. That's generally my view of ethics. So that's pretty important. I'll put the book you mentioned in the show notes as well, in addition to this book and your other books as well. I'll put them all in there. Buy all Michael Humes books. Yeah, I've got books. eight books, buy them all. Knowledge, reality, and value. Um, what movie or TV show do you think does, or plural, movies or TV shows, do you think do a particularly good or insightful job at dramatizing important philosophical issues? Yeah, I mean, I have to say Star Trek. There's like say, Star Trek? Uh, I'm a big sci-fi fan, so there might be you know lots of other non-sci-fi things I don't know um, <laughs> because I'm such a sci-fi watcher, but um, it's just so often that you know, you think of a, a Star Trek episode when you're thinking of an issue, right? So, you know, like you're, you're thinking about art, artificial intelligence and can computers really think? And then you remember like there's an issue where they have like a trial to find out whether data is a person. 
and mm -hmm. <laughs> your commander data. And then, you know, there's like this stuff about, there's all these time travel episodes. You can like talk about those. Um, they have like issues about personal identity. You know, when you talk about personal identity, you remember that there's this episode where a commander Riker got split in two by the transporter. And then, oh. there's like, so like there are two Rikers and then, yeah. And the transporter itself is the source of a famous philosophical hypothetical. Well, maybe yeah. not the Star Trek transporter, but yeah. is that where that hypothetical comes from? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, like Derek Parfit um, raises the issue of like, if you get into this thing that transports you, like uh, apparently teleports you from one location to another, is the person who gets out on the other side really you, right? And that's a thing that you should wonder about, you know, when you watch Star Trek. You're supposed to assume that it's the same person, but there's some episodes that raise the question. Here is a movie. It's not a science fiction movie, so maybe you're not aware of it. Have you seen The Prestige? Yeah, but it was a while ago. I think The Prestige, I, I don't know if it, you know, doesn't dive into it as deeply as it could, but I think it dramatizes that issue in an, in an old timey way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember liking it, but I don't remember the details of the plot anymore. There is a there is a grisly version of the transporter issue, I think, dramatized in a yeah. very fun way. I won't say more. Oh, uh, there's also lots of good ethical issues, right? So you have the like consequentialist versus deontological issues. Um, there's like the, the episode in which Captain Picard has to decide whether to um, use this lone Borg that they captured um, to try to destroy the collective. They have something that's like the equivalent of a, a computer virus that they can implant in him and then send him back to the collective. And then that would they predict that would destroy the board. Uh, and then he decides not to do it because it's wrong to use the one individual <laughs> or whatever to treat them as a means or something, I don't know. Uh, but then there's a different episode in uh, Deep Space Nine where um, they sort of come out on the side of consequentialism where um, this is the, ep the episode in the pale moonlight where um, Captain Sisko winds up, like he winds up doing all these shady things in order to bring the Romulans into the war against the Dominion. So he comes out on the consequentialist side. Yeah. And Picard's a deontologist. Right, yeah. Yeah, Star Trek seems like like a pretty solid answer. Do any any movies come to mind? Non-Star Trek movies? Oh, um, you know, like I taught philosophy and science fiction a couple of times. Um, a course that I created um, at Boulder just so that I could teach it. And uh, <laughs> um, I did, uh, I used 12 Monkeys, the movie. which To illustrate like, time travel paradoxes? Yeah, yeah. And I use that because that is one of the few time travel stories that is not blatantly contradictory, right? So it illustrates like, well, sort of a, a treatment of the grandfather paradox, right? You, like very frequently, they just like blatantly have paradoxes where somebody does something in the past that would have prevented them from going back in time in the first place. And in 12 Monkeys, instead, everything fits together. Like every, you know, person goes back in time and everything that they do there um, helps to explain why the stuff that you saw in the future was the way that it was. And presumably that just continues as a cycle. You don't go around the cycle. It just happens. Right? It's not described as a, as a time travel movie, but I think Galaxy Quest has a non-contradictory form of time travel because there's a brief machine that essentially reorganizes all the matter of the universe to be exactly like it was Presumably with the exception of one person, one person, exactly how it was 13 seconds ago. Uh -huh. And as implausible as it is, it doesn't seem to lead to yeah. traditional time travel paradoxes. Oh, yeah. I mean, so like one of my problems with time travel stories is that um, like they're directly contradictory because they depict something happening at a certain time. And then later in the show, they depict somebody doing something such that the thing that was originally depicted does not happen at that time. So it's a contradictory story. Did a thing happen at that time or not? Right? So like, you know, like the Enterprise encounters another ship, the Enterprise C that comes through a wormhole through time. And then as soon as that ship comes through, everything on the Enterprise changes. And so now you're supposed to think, oh, so the entire past, whatever, 50 years or whatever, however long it was, is now different. Like, well, wait, what do you mean? Like, give me a coherent story. Did the things happen in the last 50 years or not? Did we have the war or with the Klingons? did everything literally... Right, and like, yeah, they're saying... Or change. What they're depicting is like, first, we didn't have the war with the Klingons, and then we did have the war with the Klingons, and then later we didn't have it. 
but there's only like, <laughs> but all at the same time in the same time period, right? So what they're saying is that in a, a single time period, this war happened and did not happen. And that's contradictory. To be clear, you're not just saying it's unrealistic. It's like logically incoherent, yeah. which is a different kind of problem than say, you know, whether or not beaming beaming devices are possible. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like um, that's what doesn't happen in 12 monkeys. They don't depict anything happening two different ways. They're just like with the, you know, the first time and only time that whatever year happens that 1990 happens, it has a time traveler in it. And then, you know, and then the events from there go, you know, lead forward in a logical way to make it so that a time traveler would want to get into the time machine you know, mm -hmm. in the, at the later time. Uh, what projects, if any, are you working on right now? Well, let's see. So I have a um, debate volume that I agreed to do for Rutledge. It's a debate about skepticism. So I got to finish the debate about skepticism. So, oh, great. You're going to you're going to be the one to finish it. Yeah, I'm well, I'm the uh, I'm the non skeptic editing. And the <laughs> my co-author, Brian Francis, is the skeptic. And uh, he just like he um, has sent me his latest part. So I have to write my reply to that. So I got to finish that up. Um, after this, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do a textbook about epistemology. Is it going to be like this self-published textbook? Yes. Yeah. So it'll still have your sense of your mic humor in it. That's right. Yeah. You know, traditional okay. textbook publishers are annoying. And well, that's exciting. I'll definitely check that out. Where can people find you if they want to see follow what you're up to? Uh, I have a website, owl two thirty two o w l two three two dot net, and I have a blog. Fake news, F A K E N O U S dot net. And then, of course, there's like an Amazon author page. I'll include those on the show notes as well so people can find you. So the book is Knowledge, Reality, and Value A Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy. It's an awesome book. You should buy it. You should read it, as well as the other books. And Michael Humer, thank you so much for joining me today. Yep. Thanks for having me. That was Mike Humer, and the book today is Knowledge, Reality, and Value A Mostly Common Sense Guide to Philosophy. To find links to that book and other topics discussed in today's episode, check out the show notes. And if you like what I do here, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. And please like and leave a review. That really makes a big difference, even though it's just a small thing. I appreciate it greatly. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>